Pardon? Just to hear whether it's working. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to be uh, in IMPA back after uh, three years. Uh, this poster is from 2008. If you notice the dates on the poster. And uh, so first of all, let me uh, wish many happy returns of the day uh, to the two heroes of uh, this meeting, Professor Kleinman and uh, Professor Aron Simis. Uh, I don't know Professor Kleinman uh, personally, uh, but I am happy to. <laughs> I am happy to uh, wish him uh, happy returns of the day on behalf of uh, many Indian uh, algebraic geometers and commutative algebraists who have uh, ins have been inspired by his work. I remember especially uh, after finishing my PhD from Purdue when I went back and I asked uh, uh, R. C. Kaushik, uh, "What should I study next?" And he showed me his book. Uh, Kleinman and uh, Altman and Kleinman, growth and duality. And he said, this is the best introduction to commutative algebra. <laughs> <laughs> right. And at that time, uh, if you know a little bit about the Indian economy, uh, India was bankrupt in 1990 and 1991. And we had great difficulty in traveling uh, out, outside the country. And incidentally, August 15 is the 65th birthday of Indian Republic. This is today, yeah, and so after 600 years of foreign rule, we became independent. It will take a little bit more time to be developed, okay. Uh, uh, but uh, Aron uh, started organizing many uh, meetings in ICTP around that time. I think 92 was the first meeting, and he took uh, great care in inviting people from developing countries. And it gave me an opportunity to be in touch with many people. And those lectures in ICTP were wonderful. And that, that's what started me in this area. And I still continue. And <clears throat> so today, being part of the ELGA meeting too, uh, I have inserted a little bit algebraic geometry. I, I do not know algebraic geometry at all. Uh, but I am willing to discuss with you to get benefit from your questions. So let me uh, begin. So this is about products of complete ideals and a theorem of Rees. Rees uh, David Rees turns 94 this year. And he lives in Exeter. We celebrated his 80th birthday in 98, if you remember. Yeah. So this is about uh, his uh, theorem and a new interpretation of his theorem in terms of local cohomology and how it relates with work of Jariski and other people. Yeah. So this is the outline of the talk. I'll introduce integral closure of ideals. Uh, I'll recall Jariski's theorem about complete ideals from 1938. Generalizations of Jariski's theorem by Lipman, Rees, and Kutkowski. I'll introduce normal Hilbert polynomial of ideals and uh, state Reese's theorem on normal Hilbert polynomial of two ideals and show you how it unifies uh, many results about complete ideals. And uh, I'll state consequences of Reese's theorem. And if I have a time, I'll give a sketch of uh, Reese's theorem via local cohomology of bigraded Reese algebras. So this is a new interpretation which I want to communicate here. So let me begin. Let R be a commutative ring. I is an ideal of R. An element A is called integral if it satisfies an equation of this type where these coefficients come from the correct powers of the ideal. The integral closure, uh, of, uh, which I denote by I bar, is the ideal of all the elements which are integral over I. The set of integral elements over I forms an ideal which is called integral closure of i. An ideal is called complete if i happens to be the integral closure. Now, this is the paper of Jariski from 1938. And I read some historical articles that uh, after working in topology of algebraic varieties, 
uh, Jarisky wrote this paper, and this was the first paper in algebra that he wrote. <coughs> he, the, the author of that historical article writes that Jarisky had to begin somewhere. And this paper was inspired by his effort to uh, reprove uh, the resolution of curves and surfaces. So he introduces complete ideals in this uh, paper. And it is in a very special setting. So uh, the setting in which Jarisky worked was polynomial ring in two variables over a field, which is algebraically closed of characteristic 0. And these results were later generalized to two-dimensional regular local rings. And the place to read about this, two, uh, this generalization to two-dimensional regular local rings is the appendix 5 of volume 2 of Jarisky Samuel. Okay. And that explains why the area was kind of dormant for a large number of years. Because it is relegated to appendix. It's a beautiful theory. So let me state the two principal theorems of Jarisky. Product of complete ideals is complete in a two-dimensional regular local ring. So it shows that complete ideals form a semi-group, and Jarisky wanted to understand the structure of the semi-group of complete ideals. And it shows that this semi-group has unique factorization. Every complete ideal uh, in a two-dimensional regular local ring factors uniquely up to order as a product of simple complete ideals. Simple ideals are those which can't be factored anymore, non-trivially. So it is natural to ask, are these two theorems true for non-regular local rings? Apparently, nobody thought about this for almost 50 years. Two-dimensional? Pardon? Two-dimensional or general? General, and also in two dimension to non-regular local rings. So Jarisky says in his article in the introduction that the theory that he has put forward uh, makes sense in higher dimension, but it's not clear what should be the theorems. Yeah. So Lipman set up a uh, theory in an expository article in the proceedings for uh, Nagata's 60th birthday. And he also writes in his introduction that I'm presenting a theory uh, without theorems. Yeah. Now, the, the activity really started with a paper of Huniki in 1986, where he gave a counterexample in three-dimensional regular local ring. He says, uh, sorry, that take two integrally closed, integrally closed uh, uh, M primary ideals, I should add, M primary ideals in this localization of polynomial ring, so that the sum is not integrally closed. This happens quite often. Uh, the, uh, I mean, in complete ideals are closed uh, with respect to many operations, like intersections, or taking colons, or taking products in dimension 2, regular local ring. But they, they are not closed with respect to taking sum. So this was natural to try, that uh, consider two ideals so that the sum is not integrally closed. Now take the ideal generated by i and z, where z is a variable, and j and z in, in this three-dimensional regular local ring. And in this, the product is not integrally closed. So it, uh, it started a uh, whole lot of activity. And so this is a concrete example. Take this ideal generated by fourth power of maximal ideal in, in, uh, in polynomial ring in two variables, or power series ring in two variables, x and y, and uh, m4 and y cubed. You can check that the sum of these two ideals is not complete. Okay? And uh, the two, two ideals in, in the two-dimensional regular local ring kxy, that is not complete. But if you join z, then the product is not complete. Okay? Uh, yeah. So I, I, should, I should say i comma z and j comma z. That is not complete. Okay? Later, uh, people produced simpler examples. So take this monomial ideal generated by x square, y cube, and z square in kxyz. See, this is from Zokus and Swanson, unpublished. And take the integral closure of i of this monomial ideal, which is easy to describe in terms, in terms of lattice points in the Newton polytope. Then the square is not complete. Okay. So people, uh, it's clear now that uh, if you can go to dimension 3, regular local ring, and the Jarisky's product theorem is not true. 
and therefore one should stay probably in dimension 2 and try to see uh, wh what kind of rings have this property. And Lippmann uh, <coughs> proved that product of complete ideals is complete in a two-dimensional local ring having a rational singularity. This is a larger class than uh, regular local rings. So people, uh, the people who don't know about this, let me just recall uh, what is this term, rational singularity. A point of a scheme is called regular if the local ring is a regular local ring. A scheme is called regular if all its points are regular or smooth. A regular scheme is called a desingularization of a scheme Y if there is a proper birational map from X to Y. Now, a normal, so Lippmann defines, I mean, I think the notion is due to Michael Artin of rational singularity. A normal local ring of dimension 2 is said to have rational singularity if there is a desingularization of spec R such that the first shift cohomology vanishes. It just says that it is, it is a cohomologically trivial singularity arithmetic genus is 0. Okay? So it's a nice singularity and Lippmann in his uh, long paper uh, in IHES proceedings uh, discusses uh, the very nice properties. He does classification of rational singularities, gives their equations. Okay? and uh, relation with the unique factorization. Now, Kutkowski sort of proved that this is all that you can do, go to only rational singularities. You can't really uh, expect that the product of complete ideas is complete in bigger class of rings. So the, his theorems uh, prove this fact, that suppose you have a two-dimensional excellent local domain with algebraically closed residue field, so excellent uh, you can take it that uh, most of the rings which occur in algebraic geometry, they are all excellent, okay? but it will be a very long process to define what is excellent. Okay? Then the following are equivalent. R has rational singularity. Product of complete ideals in R is complete. Product of complete M primary ideals is complete. And if I is a complete M primary ideal, then the square is complete. So this phenomenon uh, that the product of complete ideals is complete, uh, it has really to do with the rational the, the nature of the singularity, that it must be rational. Provided we have these conditions that the, uh, the residue field is algebraically closed. If you remove this condition, it is no longer true. And uh, Kutkowski gives a very beautiful example. Uh, let k be a field of characteristic not equal to 3 and take this ring. Uh, which is parameterized by the field K, take power series ring and go modulo this cubic. Characteristic is not 3. Then he proves that RK is normal local domain. It doesn't have rational singularity. Okay, it's easy to uh, prove this. This is normal local domain by using Jacobian criterion. Uh, to prove it is not a rational singularity, one just uses the fact that it doesn't have the right multiplicity. Okay, the multiplicity should have been 2 for this to be rational. So it is not a rational singularity, but product of complete ideals is complete if you replace k by the field of rational numbers, which is not algebraically closed. Okay? So in absence of algebraically closed residue field, the two, uh, the two phenomena that the local ring is rational, has rational singularity and product of complete ideals is complete, they are not really equivalent. You must work with algebraically closed residue field. So here this occurs, but the ring doesn't have rational singularity. Then there exists an M primary complete, uh, M primary complete ideal whose square is not complete if K has positive characteristic or K is algebraically closed. Okay, these are uh, more or less algebraic statements, but there are no simple algebraic proofs. This, this occurred in uh, Invencione in 1990. Okay, so, so it shows what is the limitation to uh, the requirement that product of complete ideals is complete. Right. Lippmann uh, introduced a larger class of rings called pseudo-rational local rings for purpose of desingularization of schemes. A Noetherian local ring of dimension 2 is called pseudo-rational uh, if, sorry, yeah. Yeah, it's called pseudo-rational if it is normal, analytically unramified, which means if you take the amadic completion of this ring, the, it, it has no uh, non-trivial nilpotent elements. 
So the completion is reduced. And for every birational proper map from W to spec R, where W is a normal scheme, the first sheaf cohomology is zero. So the difference between pseudo-rational and rational is that it doesn't refer to desingularization. It only refers to normal uh, schemes and the fact that the uh, first sheaf cohomology is zero. Okay. So it is a similar condition, but desingularization is replaced by all normal W. This is a larger class uh, than the, the class of uh, rational singularities. There is an example in Nagata uh, of a ring which is, uh, uh, which is not analytically normal. And Lippmann mentions that that example is an example of a pseudo-rational local ring which does not have rational singularity. So it's, it's a larger class. And in this class, he proves, <coughs> anyway, before, before I go to Lippmann's theorem, let me remark that Ries also introduces uh, this, uh, this uh, concept of pseudo-rational, but in a slightly more generality. Ries calls a ring two-dimensional, local, analytically unramified ring pseudo-rational if the second Hilbert coefficient of the normal Hilbert polynomial, which I'll introduce in a minute, uh, is zero for all m primary ideals. Now, this is basically a condition on arithmetic genus. Okay, if you take the normalization of blow up of the sub variety vi of spec r, uh, then it's a, it gives a proper birational map to spec r, and uh, the, this coefficient really measures the length of the first sheaf cohomology module of this uh, normal uh, scheme, which, birationally, uh, which is birationally proper over spec r. So there's a slight difference, but it is essentially the same condition as vanishing of H1. A two-dimensional normal local ring having a rational singularity is pseudo-rational. Uh, Ries proves that. A Ries generalized Zariski's product theorem for M primary ideals in pseudo-rational local rings. So he proves that the complete ideal, product of complete ideals, which are M primary, is still complete in this larger class. Here we don't have to refer to any desingularization. Just a condition on uh, the Hilbert coefficient. So now let me explain uh, this, this coefficient e2 bar of i by introducing normal Hilbert polynomial. For any m primary ideal in an analytically unramified local ring of dimension d, the normal Hilbert function is defined like this. It is h bar i at the value n is length of r mod i n bar. So take the integral closure of powers of i, and then this is a well-behaved function. For large n, it becomes a polynomial basically because of the fact that the ring is analytically unramified. When you have such a condition, then there are finiteness properties uh, imposed uh, on, on various things, which, uh, which force the function, normal Hilbert function, to be a polynomial for large n. So the corresponding polynomial is called normal Hilbert polynomial. And we usually write it the way we write Hilbert Samuel polynomial of an ideal. The coefficients uh, refer to the integral closure. Okay, so it's a degree d polynomial, where d is the dimension of the local ring. And we always write it in this fashion, uh, where we take these binomials, and these coefficients are called normal Hilbert coefficients. Now, these are a bit mysterious, because only last year it was proved by Goto, Hong, and, uh, and, uh, and Mandel that this coefficient e1 bar of i is non-negative in all unmixed local rings. So we don't know much about these coefficients. Okay. Normal Hilbert polynomial, how does it behave in two-dimensional regular local ring? So there is a very nice formula given by Lippmann and Ries. Let i be an m primary complete ideal of a two-dimensional regular local ring. Then we know the Hilbert uh, the normal Hilbert polynomial here is norm Hilbert Samuel polynomial because product of complete ideals is complete. I n bar is I n by Zariski's theorem. And so the Hilbert Samuel polynomial coincides with the, uh, with the Hilbert function for all n. The polynomial can be described in a, in a nice way. It is the multiplicity of i times x plus 1 choose 2 minus 
the multiplicity minus the length of r mod i times x. If the residue field is infinite, then for any minimal reduction j of i, j i is i square. So let me recall what is uh, reduction. So j contained in i, this is called reduction. If there, ex there exists some n so that this is true for all large n. And among all reductions, one can take the smallest one with respect to inclusion. And when the residue field is infinite, all minimal reductions uh, are generated by same number of elements, which is called the analytic spread of the ideal. Now, Huniki generalized this uh, in, in a more general setting. So take a uh, two-dimensional cone Macaulay local ring, and let i be an ideal generated by a system of parameters. Then the second normal Hilbert coefficient vanishes, if and only if uh, this is true, I should have said n for all n uh, at least 1. Okay? So it is true that i square bar is i i bar. i cube bar is i i square bar. Okay? So this, this condition is equivalent to this last coefficient vanishing. And if you recall, this coefficient controlled the vanishing of the first chief cohomology, H1 of the desingularization. Okay. So in a sense, it, it identifies w what is responsible for H1 W uh, OW to vanish. It is this behavior of the minimal reduction okay, which, which forces the first chief cohomology to become zero. Right. Now, Rees, uh, let me recall this theorem of Rees from 81. Uh, take an analytically unidentified cohen macaulay local ring of dimension 2 with infinite residue field and take two m primary ideals. Okay. So, Rees works with two m primary ideals. Then, so this is a further generalization of theorems of Uniki and Jariski together. I will explain why. So, this combines many results, but you have to work with a pair of ideals rather than just one ideal. So it says that the second normal Hilbert coefficient of the product is the sum of the second normal Hilbert coefficient of i and j for any two m primary ideals. Now if you take a rational singularity or pseudo rational local ring, this is trivially satisfied because all the terms are zero. This condition is satisfied for rational singularities or regular local rings or pseudo rational local rings because everything is zero here. But he relates this condition to this algebraic condition that for all positive R and S, I R J S bar is A times I R minus 1 J S bar plus B times I R J S minus 1 bar, where A is A and B uh, form what he calls as good joint reduction of the fil double filtration of these ideals, I R J S bar, where R and S are bigger than or equal to 0. Instead of taking the filtration of powers of integral closure of powers of i, take this double filtration and then there exists, he shows there exists element A in i and B in J so that this condition is actually satisfied for large R and S. Okay. You can always construct A in i and B in J so that this condition is satisfied for large R and S. But wh what is amazing here is that if it is satisfied for all R and S positive num uh, integers, then this is equivalent to saying that the second normal Hilbert coefficient is the sum of two normal Hilbert coefficients. So let me recall what is a, a joint reduction. We say A, B is a joint reduction of the filtration, uh, double filtration. If A is in I and B is in J, and this condition uh, which is here holds for large R and S. And he proved existence of joint reductions for uh, usual filtrations and uh, integral closure filtrations. And it is called good if this condition holds that A intersection IR JS bar is A times IR minus 1 JS bar for all positive R, positive R and S bigger than or equal to 0. And the same condition holds for B. So this is like element A and B being superficial. But they are superficial in a strong sense that these equations hold 
uh, in, uh, with, uh, with much uh, stronger conditions that this is true for all positive R and this is true for all non-negative S. Okay. Then we have good joint reduction. Right. So good joint reductions exist. Uh, Reis proved that. And uh, let me state the consequences. So first let me uh, derive uh, Zariski's theorem or Lippmann's theorem that product of complete ideals is complete by, as a consequence of Reis's theorem. So first of all, uh, this, uh, the, the conclusion and, uh, and assumption don't change if you assume that the residue field is infinite. So let i and j be m primary ideals and take a good joint reduction of this double filtration of integral closure. Then because it is a good, good joint reduction, this equation holds for all R and S positive. So take R equal to 1 and S equal to 1 in this equation. Yeah. So if you take R equal to 1 and S equal to 1, then the left hand side says that the integral closure of I times J is A times J bar plus B times I bar. But A is in I, so it is in I bar and I can merge B, uh, B is in J, so it is also in J bar. So this side is contained in I bar times J bar. So these have to be equal because this is part of the integral closure trivially in any local ring. So we get that the product of complete ideals, if I and J are complete, then this I bar is I and J bar is J and IJ will be equal to IJ bar. So it will be complete. So it's, it's like magic how uh, behavior of Hilbert coefficients uh, gives Zariski's product theorem. Zariski's product theorem, Zariski proved by using techniques from resolution of singularities. He uses quadratic transforms, uh, then uh, transforms his ideals to quadratic transforms, then shows that some invariants reduce when you take blowing ups, and then comes back. So these are all classical techniques. Uh, but here, uh, Rees being master of multiplicities, he uh, showed that what, what is the phenomenon which is responsible for product of complete ideals being complete. I mean, amazingly, it also implies Hunicke's theorem about the vanishing of the second normal Hilbert coefficient. So take a two-dimensional Cohn macaulay analytically unidentified local ring with infinite residue field. Take a m primary uh, ideal. Then for any minimal reduction k of i, the second normal Hilbert coefficient is 0, if and only if this is true for all n bigger than or equal to 2. And the proof is just one line put i equal to j in Reese's theorem. Now, uh, in the remaining uh, 10 minutes, uh, let me uh, give you some idea about, about the technique that uh, Rees uses to prove his theorem. So Rees works with a pair of ideals. He generalizes Hilbert Samuel polynomial to Hilbert Samuel polynomial of two ideals. And then he is able to prove uh, theorems which involve two ideals. The philosophy is that if you want to uh, see uh, how two ideals interact, uh, it is useful to work with Reese algebra of two ideals, Hilbert polynomial of two ideals, rather than uh, just work with Hilbert polynomial of one ideal, because that br brings out the interaction between these two ideals. Okay. So suppose uh, R is a analytically un unramified local ring of dimension two. This condition is imposed to force that the normal Hilbert function is polynomial. Let I and J be M primary ideals. Then there exists a polynomial of total degree 2 so that the, the function, uh, the function length of R mod I R J S bar becomes a polynomial in R and S for large R and S. This is true in arbitrary dimension, but due to lack of time, I'm not stating the general result. Okay? So in, in dimension 2, one can describe the coefficients uh, in a very compact way. So just like Hilbert Samuel polynomials are written in terms of binomials, these polynomials are also written in terms of product of binomials. So the convention is that we take these two binomials, x plus i minus 1 choose i, y plus j minus 2 j, and gather the coefficients with a sign convention. And this is how the normal Hilbert polynomial is written. Then these coefficients have good interpretations. The normal Hilbert polynomial of m primary ideals in a two-dimensional Cohen-Macaulay analytically unramified local ring is given 
in this uh, fashion. So it relates with the uh, Hilbert normal Hilbert polynomial of the individual ideals, okay? how the coefficients are related. So the first coefficient of x plus 1 choose 2 is the multiplicity. The coefficient of x, y, it's a polynomial of total degree 2 in x and y. So the coefficient of x, y is this integer, which is called the mixed multiplicity of i and j. And the coefficient of y plus 1 choose 2 is the multiplicity of j. Okay, it is same as the hilbert samuel multiplicity. Coefficient of x happens to be the e1 bar of i. Coefficient of y happens to be e1 bar of j. And the constant term is the second normal Hilbert polynomial coefficient of i times j. Okay. So i and j and the product, they are all hidden in this uh, normal Hilbert polynomial of two ideals. Okay. Now I'll sketch a proof using local cohomology of Ries's uh, theorem. Ries uses all classical ideal theory and the proof goes on and on. Every step is clear, but it's not clear what was in Ries's mind <laughs> while writing the proof. And so I want to give a simple interpretation of uh, Ries's theorem that's really about vanishing of certain uh, bigraded component of local cohomology. Okay? One, uh, the, the vanishing of second Hilbert coefficient has to do with vanishing of H1 W O W for normal schemes. And therefore, this should also be related with local cohomology. So that's the idea and it worked. Right. So for, for non-experts in audience, let me just quickly introduce what is local cohomology. Uh, take a commutative ring, M and R module for an ideal I of R, uh, take, uh, take gamma I M, which is union of zero colon I N for all N. This is called the I torsion of M. M mapping to gamma I M is a left exact functor. Its right derived functors are called local cohomology of M with respect to I. A ring is said to be bigraded if it is graded by this semigroup N2. The bigraded components are indexed by elements in N2. And where R, the bigraded component R, S is additive subgroup. And it satisfies this product rule as it is the case in terms of uh, for usual graded rings. Element is called bihomogeneous if it belongs to this bigraded component. And Ideal is called bihomogeneous if it is generated by bihomogeneous elements. So these are analogous definitions for graded rings and graded ideals and graded modules. N2 graded, a module is called N2 graded if uh, over this bigraded ring, if uh, this component is a subgroup of M and it satisfies this product rule. Now, local cohomology of bigraded modules with support in a bigraded ideal, they are all bigraded. That's easy to see if you use the check complex that we saw in Anurag Singh's talk. Okay, so it can also be defined using check complex, but the elements that you choose, they must be bihomogeneous elements. All right, so let's consider uh, bigraded Ries algebra where the RS component is IRJS. So if R has dimension two, uh, uh, dimension D, then this bigraded Ries algebra has uh, dimension D plus two. The normalization of R is this ring. So it captures the integral closure of IRJS. Okay? And if the ring is analytically unramified, then this, this bigraded algebra, which contains the Ries algebra of I and J, is a finite module over this. And that's where analytical unramification is really needed. To, uh, we can calculate local cohomology by Kozul complex. So take uh, Kozul complex on kth power of AT1 and BT2, where A comma B is a joint reduction of I and J. Now I'm specializing to dimension two only. It can be done in arbitrary dimension, but only dimension two. Uh, take kth powers of AT1, which is in one zero piece of this algebra, and BT2, this is, uh, this is in the 0, 1 piece of this, and take their kth powers. And consider the Kozul complex on this, this is standard, uh, exact uh, standard complex. And here AB is a, is a good joint reduction. Then uh, these are the maps in the Kozul complex. The local, ith local cohomology of R bar, the, the normalization of Ries algebra, 
with respect to these two bihomogeneous elements is the direct limit of the uh, the Kuzul cohomology of this complex Fk. Okay, so we it's a it's a very short complex. One can calculate these uh, cohomologies very easily and take the direct limit, and it turns out that the r comma s bigraded component of this uh, second local cohomology of r bar is the direct limit of this quotient of ideals. The fact that a comma b can be chosen to be a good joint reduction will simplify the calculation of this direct limit. And we are able to identify the length of uh, this, the right hand side in terms of the Hilbert coefficients. Right, I'll, I'll skip this part. Okay. So this is, this is the slight generalization of Reese's theorem that the, the bigraded component at origin of the second local cohomology of R bar is happens to be this quantity E2 bar I plus E2 bar J minus E2 bar IJ. And this is also equal to this for large R and S. Okay, one must take large R and S, then this is equal. And if you remember, uh, the Reese's theorem said when this quantity vanishes. And the second part was when the numerator was equal to denominator. Okay? So the quotients are identified in terms of the bigraded component of local cohomology. And now Reese's theorem comes out, you equate both of them to zero, and uh, then uh, this quantity turns out to be zero for large R and S, but because we take a good joint reduction, it can descend all the way down to R positive and S positive. I think my time is over, so I'll skip the proof. <laughs>